just want to start off saying how very excited I am to be here. I think it is truly one of the greatest blessings that we have to come together and to worship, yes, but to come together and worship with people that want to, to, to be here and, and worship God's Word and to be with children that want to be here and learn from God's Word and be around one another and to sing songs with people that want to sing and, and praise our God. I, I don't know how you don't get excited about being here. It is just such a good thing to gather together with God's people and to open His Word together and just to think, I, I don't know, I don't know if this... I don't know if this is the guy that we support. Mickey, you might be able to help me out here. Uh, there, there's a couple of Trimores on Facebook. Trimore, Trizola, is that the one we support or is that the other one? That's the other one. That's the other one, okay. So not the guy we support, but before we came here, getting ready to, to pack everything up and come back, and I'm, me and Holly are scrolling through Facebook, and we see uh, a video of them singing Our God, I think it was Our God is Alive, and they're singing this in, in their African dialect, and it's, I don't understand a word that they're singing, but what I understand is their excitement. They are excited to sing about their God. And I said, I just asked Holly, what's it going to be like to sing praises with them in heaven? Because I can't sing that song. I have a feeling they can't sing our songs, but our excitement for worshiping God carries through. And it just is it's so wonderful to me. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. In just a moment, we're going to talk a little bit about what Micah read, and I'm so thankful for him reading that chapter for us. We're not going to talk about the whole chapter. We're talking about one verse out of that chapter. But I had an opportunity to participate in a survey. You have five passages. They can be one verse long or one chapter long, minimum, maximum, to explain the Bible. How do you do it? That's all you get is five passages. And so I gave it a little bit of thought, and as I went through them, and, and Granted, if you ask me this next week, I'll probably give you five different verses. As I went through them, Isaiah 52 came to my mind as one of the most important passages in the Bible. Specifically, Isaiah 52, verse 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news and announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Had an opportunity to sit with the kids before in, in, our, in the teenage class and ask them, we're going to talk a little bit about this verse tonight. We're going to spend some time talking about concepts from this verse as we go through the next couple of weeks. What stands out to you? And very quickly, they honed in on this phrase, your God reigns. Key message of the Bible from the beginning to the end is the message that God reigns and that he is sovereign. And that's what I asked them. I said, what does it mean to be sovereign? If you're going to use that word in a sentence, what, how would you use it? What are you trying to convey? And very accurately, I think it was Matty Baxley said, well, number one, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use the word sovereign in a sentence. And I think that is fair. I doubt any of us use that word very often. So trying to explain to them, what, is, what does it mean to be sovereign? And we wound up with a scenario where Somerset has annexed itself from America and declared themselves a sovereign nation with Jackson Ray as the president and Emily, uh, uh, Izzy Ray, I think, as the minister of defense and World War III is on the cusp. And, but we are not under the rule of any other nation. We are sovereign. The idea is we have all rule. And that's what we came with. How do we describe that? And they came up with so, so many better terms than I did. I thought, how do we describe an all-ruling God? Maybe we say he's the head honcho. The buck stops here. They said, no, we say he's the king. We say he's the creator. We say he's the savior. They came up with so many better descriptions that show us our God reigns and what that means in our life. And because of that, there's another phrase that I think we should consider, and that is our God has the ultimate authority. And that's what I hope to talk just for a very little bit about tonight. We're going to set some foundations, but I hope in the future to be able to, to, to build upon these foundations more as we consider the concept of God's authority and what that means for us in our life. Because the term authority should be important to us. Authority isn't just about 
legalism. And I think that's where uh, very quickly when we have conversations about authority, especially with people uh, in the world or people maybe in a denominational sense, uh, very quickly terms like legalism and merit start getting thrown around. You think that because you cross all the T's and dot the I's, you think because the way you do things, that makes you holy, that makes you set apart. I want to be very careful that when we talk about authority, we're not talking about a, a code, a, a legal document that, that makes us, by our adherence, more holy than someone else. That's not what we're trying to convey. We need to, if ever we approach that in that way, we need to rethink authority. Because authority is not about these things. Authority is about power. Authority is about the um, ability to rule, whether that be an inherited power or a delegated power, but it is the ability to rule. Authority is about honor and it is about respect. I want you to consider the, I think a great picture of this oftentimes, maybe it's it's overused, the idea of police officers. Police officers have a, um, an authority, a power, a, a right in which they can make judgments and they can rule in certain situations, but also that power deserves honor, respect, not just because of their authority, but because of the sacrifice inherent in that, in that job that they commit or in that job that they, they do, the, the, the risk that they take. So when we start to think about that, we might start to see authority, not just as I have the power to control you, but there is a reason for you to listen to me. There is a reason for you to consider the things that I say and the things that I'm doing. And so when it comes to God, you know, we, we, we talked in class about analogies this morning. When we're trying to make an analogy that describes God, anything, any analogy we use that's going to utilize human reasoning, human concepts, is going to fall flat. It's not going to be able to, to accurately convey what is the glory and majesty of God. So we're not going to try to use analogies. Let's just use God's word. When we think of authority... What do we think of when it comes to God? And I want us just to use some of the words that our kids come up with. One, God is our creator. From the very beginning of the Bible, this is being set forth, Genesis 1. We're understanding that God has an inherent right to rule. That is just just a, a foundational building block of who he is as the creator of all things. He has the right to rule over it, a power to rule over it as his position of creation or creator over creation. But also, as we consider the fact that God is king as well, we see that in the the image of Christ throughout the Gospels. And when you consider that, He is in this position of authority as Lord. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 talks about Him being the king of the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to Him that we're being transferred into. And Colossians 1.18 describes Him as the head of that kingdom. Specifically, the language there uses head of the body, which is his church. But he is in the position that has the right to tell, just like my brain has the right to tell my fingers what to do and my mouth what to say. He is in the position to have control and and power and, and right to rule over top of the kingdom. But we also see in the Holy Spirit the picture of authority. As the revealer of the mind of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in verses 10 through 13. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 10 through 13 talks about how God, as our creator, as the, and has all right to rule, his mind is being revealed to us. For to us, God revealed through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among man knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in, that, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. He's telling us. The Spirit has authority because it's coming. He is coming from God to bring us His mind, His thoughts, the thoughts of the ruler, the thoughts of the creator, the thoughts of the king. And 2 Peter chapter 1 goes on to repeat this in a way, verses 20 and 21, saying, It was not, when we read the word of God, 
It's not we're reading the words of man. It's not that men prophesied what they wanted to prophesy, but it's the Spirit who revealed to us the mind, the thinking, the words that God as our Creator has for us. So over and over again, what we're seeing when it comes to foundations of authority, God has ultimate authority. What does that mean? That means inherently He has the right to rule over us as our Creator, as our King, as the vehicle to to reveal His, His, His thoughts to us. But there's one more that we need to consider. And that is not a a foundation of authority in that God having all authority, but it's a foundation authority in that man does not have these same rights. Man has proven over and over again to be unfit to have ultimate and final authority. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, we learn that it is not even in man to direct his own ways. It's not in me to say this is the direction that Kyle Blevins needs to go. Far be it from me to be the one that directs your path. I am not fit for that. Proverbs 14, there's a way that seems right unto man, but, the way, but it ends in death. Over and over again, the Bible is going to reveal to us through example and through command that, God, or that mankind is not able to be the holders of this sovereign, ultimate authority. And while the word may seem very churchy, it's not a very churchy word. It is rather fundamental to our lives. When we step outside of this body and we go into the world around us, we recognize that we want good and trustworthy authorities. We don't want incompetent people in places of authority. When people disregard authority, it kind of rubs us the wrong way. If you pull out here on the 27 and find any stoplight in the city and wait there long enough, you're going to find somebody that disregards the authority that stoplight has. Stoplights, it's an inanimate object. It has no attitude. It has no thought. It has no mind. And yet, it has the authority to tell you, go, stop, or go really, really fast. (laughs) No, that's not really what that means. And when someone disregards that, that red light throws up and they're on their phone or they're just in a hurry and they blow through that, we don't like that because they have disregarded the authority. Yes, I wish somebody, I wish a police officer saw that. They deserve to to be in trouble for that. But really, because they've put me at danger and themselves at danger and everyone around them at danger because disregarding authority has consequences. And the same thing is true in Scripture. In the book of Jude, in the book of Jude, we, we read a warning that we are to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all handed down to the saints. And Jude goes on to speak about men that we need to be contending with, men who are marked out for condemnation, men who deny the Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 11, he describes them this way. He says, these are men who have gone the way of Cain rushed into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Authority is foundational in our lives and authority is foundational in our faith. Whenever we disregard God's authority, and in fact, in Jude, he talks about disregarding authority there as well as he talks about them denying the Lord, denying the Master, brings up how they are uh, how, how they are neglecting the authority that he has. When we do that, he gives us three examples. Three examples of people who could be described in similar ways. Cain, disregarding the authority of God by, by not following his instructions by faith in Genesis chapter 4. And where did that lead? It didn't lead to Cain being glorified. It didn't lead to God being glorified. It, in fact, it brought the first murder into, the, in, in, into life, into, onto the earth. Numbers 22 talks about Balaam. And and I want you to consider where Balaam starts. He says, God has all authority. I can't speak a word unless God says it. I can't speak against God. But over and over again, he is offered 
riches and wealth and to the extent in which he eventually places worldly value and personal gain above the will of God and leads the Israelites into idolatry and and all sorts of, of promiscuity because of what he was going to gain from it. He sets aside God's authority that he knows for worldly gain. And then number 16, we have the the example of Korah. Korah led an effort to question and rebel directly against the authority that God had and the authority that he had put inside of Moses. He had had, had placed authority on top of Moses to lead his people. And not only does Korah reject that, but he rebels against God as well. And I want you to remember here, why is this so foundational? Korah didn't suffer alone. When we ignore authority, it has wide-reaching impacts. The the example of of Korah tells us about the families, not just one or two people, but the families that were swallowed up in the sin of Korah and the rebellion against God. And so in this sense, really, we might be able to maybe take a, a far enough step back to say all sin, all sin is a rebellion against God's Authority. Adam and Eve in the garden began this when God, (laughs) through his authority, said, This is what is good. I'm authorized to make this judgment. Another another thing for, for authority is I have the right to make judgments. I have the right to declare what is right and wrong, good and bad, true and untrue. God says, This is what is good repeatedly. In those first two chapters of Genesis, he made it, and he looked at it, and he declared it good. Adam and Eve, disregarding the authority that God had with a desire to take authority on their own self, to say, we want to be able to have the right to make that judgment, what is good and bad. And where did that lead? It led led the whole world following in their footsteps into sin. So this is not... This is not an unimportant thing. And there's something I want to say at, at, at the onset of this study. When we talk about authority, I, I don't want us to, to hear that and think, you know, I've heard sermons on this before. Command, example, necessary inference. You know, I've, I've heard all that. I'm, okay, I know what authority is. But but really, is, is that really the most important thing for us to be talking about right now? I mean, we need to talk about grace, and we need to talk about faith, and we need to talk about letting our light shine. And I agree, we need to talk about those things. But what happens? What happens when we say, you know, what authority, that was something that our ancestors debated and fought over and, 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 and strove to try to, to, to set things in a path that followed God's authority. You know what? That, that's not as big a deal today as it was then. What happens when a generation says authority is not the most important thing for us to be considering right now? You turn to the book of Judges, you see the answer. The very last verse of the book of, of Judges, Judges 21, 25, uh, judges, I may have that backwards. Judges twenty, uh, no, I've, Judges twenty one twenty five. What do you find there? There is no king at this time. There is no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, God reigns. We already saw as Creator, God has the right to rule. But God reigns. God was reigning in the days of the judges as well. Was there an authority in Israel? Yes. Was there a king over Israel? Yes. But the problem was not that God had just not made himself known, that God was not ready to take the throne. Everyone gathered authority from themselves. I want to be the one that rules my life, that directs my steps. We must recognize the importance of a study on authority. It is foundational to our lives as Christians. It is foundational for the continued growth of the church. And in every aspect of our life, we are shaped by the sovereignty of our God. 
So before we end, I want us to circle back around to something. And that is this idea of inherited uh, inherited and delegated authority. And we're, we'll wrap things up after this. An inherited authority is an authority that's held out of being in a position. So you're, you're in this position, so you have this right. You might think of a, a judge that has the right to pronounce a judgment, and it's because they hold this position. We're in this position, and so we have this right. Or maybe more, more a better example, that is a king. A king has right to rule over their kingdom because of the position they hold within that kingdom. God possesses this sort of, of, this sort of authority. And when I say that, when I say God possesses, God possesses that in the only true sense. Judges, kings, police officers, anything else that you might think of says, okay, they're in this position so they have this authority. They only possess that because God allows it. So even with them, we don't see truly inherent authority. The only position in all of creation and outside of creation to hold inherent authority by right to rule by position and power is our God. And so we need to understand that, but we also need to understand the idea of delegated authority as well. Delegated authority is where someone with authority gives permission or license or, or grants somebody else to exercise authority on their behalf. And so, for example, with this, um, Jackson Ray. Jackson Ray has been delegated authority to operate a motor vehicle on the streets of Somerset, Kentucky. Well, and I guess th throughout the state, maybe throughout the country. So he has been delegated authority to operate a motor vehicle on our public roads. He has been given a license, and he can hold that license up. It says this, someone says, why are you on the road, Jackson? Why are you driving around? He can pull that license out and say, I'm on the road because I have authority to be here. But he's in this strange little part of his life where that license doesn't, isn't all the authority because mom and dad also play a part in this and they can say, give me the keys, you're not driving right now. And so his, his license coupled with permission from his parents that gives him this delegated authority to go out and drive his car on the road. What that does not give him the license or the authority to do is say, all right, Luke Harris, you go for a drive. Come on, get behind the wheel and take me down. I'm just gonna ride while you drive down the road. He has delegated authority, but he doesn't have inherent authority to, to grant that to others as well. And when we talk about God's authority in these lessons, we're going to need to understand the difference between these two because we're talking about his inherent authority, but also the authority that he delegates to the church. And we're going to cover topics as we go through these lessons. And I want to say right off the bat that it is not my intention to set myself up as authority. I think we might get into a dangerous situation when we start saying, okay, this is what we can do and this is what we can't do because I said so. Because that's how I understand the Scripture and that's how you need to understand the Scripture. We're not going to put ourselves in that position. What I hope rather we will do is we will put ourselves in a position to say, God has all authority. And that should direct us when we make decisions about what the church's work is going to look like, what our worship is going to look like. He holds that. Now, we might have authority delegated to us to work on his behalf and to work in the world for him, but let it never be said that we tried to usurp that authority and rise ourselves to a place where we have the right to, to rule and the right to judge. Rather, instead, we submit ourselves to the king who has that right and commit ourselves to doing things the way that he has given us, granted us the authority to do. And that is my hope in the course of these lessons. All right, so as we end, uh, we started in Isaiah 53. We're going to end in Romans chapter 10. So you can turn your Bibles over there. Romans chapter 10. And look with me in verse 15. Because here in verse 15, Paul quotes where we began. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news 
of good things. That's how Apostle Paul puts it. Good news of good things. Isaiah said it was uh, good. It was it was good news. Well, I didn't write it down. I should have. I apologize. Let's go back to Isaiah 52 for a minute. Isaiah says it was, it was, uh, he brings good news of happiness. And Paul says it is good news of good things. What is it? That's the question we want to ask here at the end. What is the good news that he brings? And I think it's twofold. Number one, it's God reigns. That's where we started, right? God is sovereign. He has all authority. God reigns. But what did he do with his sovereignty? What did he do with his authority? He stepped into a world that had rejected him. He stepped into the lives of broken and corrupt people. And he exercised his authority to take their sin and to bear the punishment for it. This is the good news And truly, it is beautiful when you take the good news to the world around you to let them know that you don't have to be, you don't have to be lost in sin. Just a moment, we're going to sing on on bended knee, I come. I think that's the song that Jason had on bended knee. The good news of happiness, the good news of good things is that you can recognize today that God reigns that he is sovereign, and that he has used his authority to make you free, to allow you to be a part of his kingdom. And if we can assist you with that this evening, that is our greatest desire. So if there is something that we can do to help you to submit yourself, to bow yourself before the king, and to be cleansed by him, and to be made pure and holy by him, please come forward right now. Let's talk about it together as we stand and sing.